Um, it is my great pleasure today to introduce David Botter. Uh, David got his PhD at MIT and then went on to do postdoc at Berkeley. Uh, in David's talks, he sometimes includes a, a photograph of traffic patterns, a traffic sign in Berkeley. Will we see that one today? No, that's not going to be here. No. Uh, Actually, no, I will have that. Not that, not that one. So there's a, there's a particularly Byzantine traffic sign in the Bay Area that David often shows as sort of an, an, an illustration of why cognitive control is very important. And I spent a, a semester in Berkeley on sabbatical. I thought about you about every single day. Um, David's done a really uh, amazing line of work on cognitive control, executive functions, role of the frontal lobe. I'm looking at this question through a number of different lenses, including some really innovative lines of work. Um, I think most of us who are in the cognitive neuroscience world realize that we have to pay very close attention to what those stupid lobes are doing. <laughs> and if you're like me, you've paid close attention to David's work to try to help you unpack that. Uh, David's been uh, extremely prolific as a researcher with publications in all the best outlets, um, funded by NIH, the Sloan Foundation, McDonald Foundation. Um, but one of the things I think I most admire about David's CV is his record of mentorship. Amazing group of students and postdocs Grad, honors theses that have come through his lab and sort of launched a number of really uh, interesting science papers. Thank you so much for that intro, and yeah, thanks for, for, for being here. So I'm really really happy to have this invitation. I've enjoyed the conversation so far. So I hope uh, I hope you find this interesting. So um, so yeah, as Emily was saying, my lab focuses primarily on um, other arrow. Other arrow. The down one. Oh, the down one. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, this is cognitive here. control, by the way. I should point out there's a rule based function that I didn't have. Um, so, my lab studies cognitive control, and so, which is also sometimes called executive function. And you'll hear lots of different things. It's a hard thing to define. Often, we have debates about what is cognitive control. Um, here's, so here's a definition cognitive control allows us to implement courses of action based on our goals, our plans, our context. And what that really means is, and if I really to paint with a broad brush, right, is that cognitive control allows us to connect what we know about the world, our goals, with our behavior. And, there's a, and, it's, and it's sort of a, maybe the, in my opinion, the sort of insight from the study of control is that those two things um, require a linking function. Right? That just knowing the rules of the game, right, being or having a goal or having some knowledge is insufficient to, to say that you'll be able to achieve it, right, that you'll be able to assemble the right actions. So cognitive control is required for that bridging. And a big piece of that is that the same input states can come in, and because of whatever context you're in, you might have to take different actions. Right? And so often the example you're given for a cognitive control might be as follows. These are, and you've heard me give this example before, but these are my kids. Right? We spend a lot of time with them teaching them a basic control, a basic rule. That they need cognitive control to follow. And that's, we call it the indoor voice rule. You know this rule? So it's basically <laughs> when you're inside, Right? They're supposed to speak softly and you know, behave kind of in an indoor way. And when they're outside, then they can you know, go wild and scream and, and shove their brother if they don't want to. Um, so, that, so to some degree, this is a nice example of control in the sense that you have to, um, for them to behave, they have to maintain a context right? if they're indoor or outdoor, and they use that in some way to um, And this is a, kind of an example of where you often would run into, you often encounter about how context depends. But my lab in the last um, several years has been interested in maybe this harder problem, um, which we call hierarchical cognitive control. Okay, and that sort of recognizes that in, in real life, you actually have multiple contexts, right, that are unfolding over different time scales and have different kind of relationships and ranking to one another. And it makes the problem much, much harder to solve in terms of behavioral problems. So if I were to extend this example, right, of my kids, right, the, 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 the rule they've actually learned is that the indoor rule, voice rule, is of a class of rules that only applies if I'm there, right? <laughs> so in this context, right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm serving a context where I'm not necessarily telling them how to behave. I'm telling them how to relate other elements of their context to the behavior, right? So we've, been, we've sort of, there's a nesting property, right, to these rules. And solving this kind of problem, which is very, very difficult, and we know it's particularly difficult because a wide range of both neurological and psychi psychiatric disorders particularly ones that involve the frontal lobe, whether this is dementia, eye or stroke, tumor. This is a degenerative disease called Pick's disease that results in degeneration of the frontal lobe. Um, that the, these patients will have in common an inability to connect knowledge and action, but particularly in these, in these cases where it's complex, where it's hard, where you have to have lots and lots of um, 
rule. Something you often don't learn, I didn't really know until I started studying patients as a postdoc, is that a lot of these patients will do fine on Stroop tasks and Wisconsin card sorting tasks and things like that. The kind of neuropsych tests that we give them to evaluate executive function, they'll be fine, then they'll wander out of the lab and they're unable to piece together dinner. Because those kinds of things require tracking context in time and assembling action accordingly. Okay, and so we've been really interested in this hard problem, which is um, it's more complex in lots of ways, and so it requires attacking it from you know, a number of different um, from a number of different approaches. And so, um, but we call it sort of this hierarchical control problem. And so I'm going to I'm going today I'm going to I'm going to give you my conclusions now. Um, so this way, if you fall asleep, or whatever, fine. At this point, just remember these things, and you'll be fine. You don't have to worry about the support system. Um, so <laughs> three main conclusions. And this I'm hoping to get to in this talk. So first, there's a, a, a cognitive function, which we call working memory gating, that we think is really important for this kind of control, particularly for, particularly for hierarchical control. In fact, we think this is the critical piece that you need for bridging knowledge and action very often. Okay? And, and I'll just, I'm going to spend some time talking about that. Okay? So it's, it's critical for hierarchical control. And getting the right gating policies is a big determinant of, of how you perform on the task, quite apart from your competency in other ways. Tell you what I mean by that. So learning getting policies is important, and I'm going to show you some evidence that it occurs over two, two time scales. So there's a sort of fast, immediate, first time you encounter a task, kind of um, learning that happens, where you have to assemble the right getting policies, and then there's a slower um, process that unfolds over a longer time. Okay. Those are different, they have different sources of okay. And then finally, and this is where I'm, I'm really hoping I can get, um, is uh, um, that a big piece of that longer time scale learning, we think, is that the prefrontal cortex is assembling a task representation that's very high dimensional. And I'll say what that means. And that confers a certain uh, kind of advantages to behavior, to efficiency of behavior, that is crucial for doing these kinds of complex. This is actually where my lab is moving now, and it's, we're very excited about it. But it's a big technical problem. So for the imagers who are interested in the room, there's going to be a lot of kind of methods of stuff. Actually be able to evaluate. There we are. Um, let's get let's start then with this working memory gating problem. Okay, so what are the what do I mean by working memory gating, and why is it a mechanism for hierarchical control? We've done a lot of work on this. I'm not going to cover all of this today. Right, I'm going to try to zoom into the piece that we need, but I do need to give you some background on what uh, what I mean by this. Okay, so in the lab, we don't typically test people. I'm not, I'm not like bringing you know college students in and saying like talking to indoor boys or something. Right, so we um, we give them these dry laboratory tasks, but they're meant to model the same kind of nested or hierarchical rule structure that we get in this context. Okay? And so one example of this is um, might be you give someone say a simple rule like you know if you see the color red, right, you press the one key. If you see the color blue, you press the two key. Very simple rule. The state here, the color tells you exactly how to behave. Really simple first order rule. Okay, but then let's say I teach you some additional rules. I teach you that. Circles mean press one and squares mean press two. Okay. Now, if you encounter, say, a red square, you're not sure what to do, right? You have an overlap in these in these rule representations. So you have need some additional bit of information. Could be another cue. Could even just be an instruction I gave you recently that told you do the color task. Okay. In that case, you have to use now an additional context, right? The episode I'm in, right? The <laughs> color task in order to to separate right this set of rules from that set of rules and behave. Okay. In doing that, I've now made uh, a more complex rule. I've nested these hierarchically, and I can do I can manipulate rules then by increasing, the, say, the depth of these trees to make them more hierarchically demanding. Okay, and I can even pit that against other ways of making the task more difficult. For instance, increasing the breadth of these trees, which makes it harder. Right, more choice um, demand, but it's no more abstract in the, um, in the hierarchical sense. Okay, and so you're going to see rule structures like this as our way of kind of manipulating. Well, at least in these uh, these experiments today, we do it in other ways as well. But... So, why is working memory gating then important for these kinds of rules? So, first, let me I have to define for you what I mean by working memory gating. Right? So, um, so working memory, as we probably know, right, is a system for remembering information over sh over short time scales that we need to use right at a given point in time, and it's a limited capacity system. Right? The idea is you maintain it active and available. Right for processing whatever information is there, but you don't have a very large capacity to do that, and so um, we have to, in some way, control the contents of working memory if it's going to be effective. Okay? And for that, we use we use gating. Okay, so um, 
there are two ways then you could potentially control memory then in this in this um, way I'm conceptualizing it, right? So one is you can control the, the input to working memory. Right? I can decide of all the things in the world, I'm only going to let the things that are really relevant to my task. And if I'm in a control setting, the things that like is my parent in the room, that's something I got to hold in working memory. I don't have to hold the fact that there's a dog barking a block away, perhaps. Um, so that can be um, this metaphor of a gate is the idea that you keep that closed for information that isn't doesn't have a lot of utility for what you're doing. You open it to allow into working memory. Okay, so that's one way you can control memory. That's an input gate. And then um, of the information in memory, you can also control which of those things you're holding is relevant right now to guide your behavior. You select from within memory something to be to guide your behavior. And they call that an output gate. Control over what's in memory. Um, selection from within memory. Now, the um, computationally, and this, this, this is something that emerges uh, not in our work, but from people who've done modeling and memory systems and so forth, there's a trade-off between flexibility and stability. Okay, and if you don't know what I mean by this, like the example I give is that, um, like, like if I'm in my office, right, and I'm working on a, on a grant, a good little backward number, and um, you know, I'm, I'm there doing, I have, I have Mac mail, Okay, and so they're like, they're like a, and I have it with the badge that tells me when new messages are coming in. So I've got, you know, so it's like, that's like incrementing away on this other task. Okay, it's a very salient cue to another task. But if I really want to get this grant done, I need to be stable enough to resist that task cue and stay on task. Okay, so I have to be stable. So that's good. That's stability. But if like one of my graduate students runs in, it's like, you know, the servers are melting down. I don't want to be like, nope, got to work on my grant. Right? I have to, at that point, you have to be flexible enough Right, to shift to this more important task. And so things that you do in a system, this dilemma between flexibility and stability is, is a big problem for control. And anything you do in a system <laughs> to make it more stable will typically make it less flexible and vice versa. So one way that this is essentially a stability flexibility dilemma as well, in a sense that you want your updating rules right, to be flexible. That's your flexibility, but you, that's going to trade off against the things you do to make memory more stable. And so the way so the brain solves that, in our view, the hypothesis that we've been working on, is with a division of labor in the brain. It assigns the um, sort of the stability function, the maintenance function of memory to the cortex. And if you're interested in cognitive control, specifically the prefrontal cortex, okay? And that's gonna be controlled by, the, by gates, which are effectively the basal ganglia. And it's interactions between the basal ganglia and the cortex that allow that updating to happen. So those corticostradal interactions. Effectively, it separates them the stability from the flexibility. That's our, that's our overarching hypothesis. Can I try this thing? Sure. Will you make a connection to input result of the reading? Or are you saying both the strain could do either one or both? Yeah. So the strain actually, in our view, does both. It does input getting and does output getting. The thing it isn't doing is maintaining the okay. And in fact, the, the model, I mean, I'm not going to go into the, the details of the modeling in this, as we have, um, but it's it's the, the um, it's based on the same kind of computations that we think the striatum does in the motor domain. So if you, if you know, the, the classic neuroscience notion would be that if I have a motor, if I have an action I want to take, right, so I want to elicit this reach, that action, that motor plan gets activated in premotor cortex, but it's under, in, but the thalamocortical dynamics are under, aren't strong. They're not strong because it's under tonic inhibition, right, from the pallidum, the basal ganglia. But if, but there's a positive feedback loop that isn't, if it's adaptive, it feeds down to the striatum, right? In this case, the putamen. And if that's, if, if based on what the, the contextual inputs, that's useful, it can disinhibit that and that amplifies that representation. So that's the classic reason why you, way that you would, you would control motor responses in basal ganglia. The model here says the same thing happens for working memory. So in other words, now, rather than a motor action that gets gated, it would be, a working memory representation. So if that context is adaptive to, to use right now, you have that same disinhibitory loop amplify that representation. Okay, it allows you to control in a, in a value-based way what is in memory is updated and what's not. It's that flexibility side of the memory. It also allows you to solve these hierarchical control problems. So this cartoon is not the model, but this kind of tries to lay out for you how that might happen. So these bubbles up here represent cortex. Okay, you can think of these like little memory buffers. Okay, and down here is a little sketch of the, of the basal ganglia. Okay. And these are, are basically loops, anatomical loops that um, we know exist between patches of cortex and the striatum. Okay. In this case, what we've done is separated these loops based on levels of these rules. 
just to show you how this could work. Now, this is, we can implement this as a neural network model in the work we have. But, um, just for today, let's go to the cartoon. So, imagine that I'm trying to follow this rule, and I've learned that right now I'm in the shape test. Okay? So, you might be maintaining then, so an implicate says that's useful. So, you maintain the working memory, the shape test. Okay? You also maintain, let's say I, I get a red circle, for instance, on this trial. Okay? So, I'm maintaining both the color red and the shape circle, that's going to input to the stratum, okay, which of these needs to be outputted, and there's another stratal loop that is controlling the output of this, going to amplify one of those, and allows it to be transmitted, well, it's, it's getting input based on whatever, by this out, this gets outputted, right, the shape, that acts as a top-down influence into the stratum, which along with this input, allows it to output gate shape, now the shape can act as a contextual input for what response to make, okay, and so by, the, the reason I Sort of lay this out is there are, that following this rule then requires not just holding the information in mind, but a dynamic, right, whereby you can control when input and when output happens at each um, level, layer of working memory in order to follow the rule. And this is sort of why, and maybe in plural form, why it's so hard to connect knowledge and action. It's not enough to know that I should be pressing one with a red circle. I have to also know about how to manage input and output within my memory systems in order to make that. And that's the and that's the, the the control problem. So what's our evidence then? Do we have any evidence for this corticostradal model of gating? And this is the last maybe background slide I want to show you is an experiment um, that Chris Chatham did several years ago. He's a postdoc in my lab, um, testing this idea that gating and particularly output gating might involve these corticostradal circuits. Okay? And so we gave people in this experiment a, a hierarchical rule um, where they learned that a number that acted as a higher order context would tell people which um, type of stimulus, either these sort of winding items, letter items, was relevant to make a response. Okay? And so the way this would work, just to make it clear right on a trial, is you get, for example, um, the number one. So that context tells you now that wingdings matter. Okay, then you get a wingding or a letter, one of them. And so in this case is a letter. You get a wingding, and then you have to choose which of these targets, and these could be separated in time, but which of these targets. Um, has the target item. So in this example, a one appears, you know you don't care about A, you hold the sun in working memory, and so then you press this. Make sense? Okay. So the way I describe that trial, it's an input-gated trial. So I'm using the context to decide which of these items to input to working memory. So I know in advance what it is. Right. And so we call those context-first trials, and they assume that they involve input gating. Now, um, we Chris manipulated the order here as well, though. So he could also do have you could have trials like this, where, for instance, the um, uh, A would appear, and then the sun, and then the one, for example. So now you don't know if the A or the sun is relevant, so you have to input them into working memory. And now, when you get the context, you select the relevant item. In this case, you say sun to make your response. Okay? So nothing's changed about the rule in this case, but we have changed the dynamics of the world. Right? You have how you manage working memory is different. In this case. You can rely on an input gating rule, and this one you have to rely on an output gating rule. Um, so, and, and one thing you'll note um, is that there's a frank working memory difference between these two cases, right? In the sense of load difference, right? You're holding two items here and one item here. So, Chris also included another con. So, we call these selected conditions. You have to pick one of the items and not the other one. He also included a third context, number three, which was a global condition. In that case, you had to pick, you had to use both items and respond on the basis of their conjunction. And he would control across trials whether or not one of them appeared in both sides. You really had to use both. Right? And what's nice is, in this case, you can still manipulate context first or context last, but it's in a load controlled way. So if we contrast across these cases, then we can contrast conditions of input gating versus output gating while controlling. So um, I want to start by just showing you there's a lot to this study, and I encourage you to read the paper. I just want to kind of give you the basic behavioral effect. Um, it's important for the rest of the talk. So um, there are two, this is just showing you response time. There are two main things to note about this. Okay, so I have it on. Um, here's the response time. I've got context first conditions and context last conditions selected in global speech. The first thing to note is that context last is generally slower than context first, even when the load is matched, okay? And that's because it's harder to output gate to some degree than to be proactive and, and just an input gate. When you know something's a high priority item, you're gonna be faster. The second thing that was notable here 
and this was a big surprise to reviewer number two, is that um, the selective condition is slower than the global condition. Okay, so why was that surprising? Well, you might think that responding to a conjunction of items, right, as in the global case, would be harder than just responding to one item. Okay? But um, in fact, and this is now something you see consistently, it's actually harder to pick one of the items out of memory and not the other one. Right, to do this selective choice within working memory. And that puts the strongest demands, and then again, the working memory load is, is matched here, but that puts the highest demands on the sort of working memory gating process. It seems like the, the difference between the two cases is also whether you can store the action or whether you have to store the trigger for the uh, in the, in the In the case where the, where the, where the, um, where the context comes last, mm -hmm. right, you could you know, kind of you see, you see the, the input, right? And, and say, so, okay, that's left, so that's one. And so now you have a, a competition between actions rather than behavior. This is an excellent point. I should say also that, that even if you do separate out and, and you change, change it to, to control for the action side of things, you still see an advantage in context first because you can also build an attentional template, right? Which people do. You're like, I'm gonna look for the, I'm gonna look for the sun, right? And they're gonna be faster on that. And actually, um, we have, a, we have a, a paper that we, we actually leverage that to say when people are implicating that. You're right, there are, there are other advantages to that as well. Okay. Um, okay, so we did this in fMRI, just, and I just want to show you uh, our evidence then that we do see these kinds of compass vital uh, um, circuits that we get involved when you do gating. So if we do a contrast between output gating and input gating selectively, right, controlling for load, right, we find activity in a frontal parietal network, right, which is pretty common now. Um, specifically in this more caudal portion, right, what we call pre PNG, which we often see for these kinds of second order rules um, that, we, that we're doing here. A little black line is from another study where we did we manipulated the difficulty of second order rules. Right? The locus, if you blow it up. Right? So they tend to be very, this is a pretty consistent map. However, if you look, if you see the basal ganglia, right, you take the caudate specifically, and now you ask, where in the brain, we do a, what's called a PPI analysis. So we ask, where in the brain do we see an increase or a change in connectivity over baseline when people are doing selective output gating in a, in a, in a low controlled way? We specifically pull up that same other part on that and the one that tends to link with that, that basal ganglia, uh, the caudate. Okay, so you get greater connectivity then, right, and greater activity in that circuit when people are doing the gating. Uh, we also report in the study that, that there are behavioral correlates of these, um, such that activity in the and declines when people have more efficient gating, and you also see greater connectivity um, between striatum and prefrontal cortex. So, in general, when people are engaged in these kinds of um, gating operations, we, we, we see activity in this, um, in this frontal um, and parietal portion. Okay, so now let's get to this question I, I started with, was, how, that, how then do people match gating policies to that? Why is it, and I, I sort of asserted at the beginning that we think it's really important. So what's our evidence for that? And are they really a component of task knowledge? And I'm making the, the, the claim that um, knowing a rule isn't enough, right? and, that, and that's what cognitive control tells us, but the, what the, <laughs> one, at least one of the missing pieces here is getting the right gating policy. People do that, they'll be more efficient, right? and that's sort of the link, and it's independent from rules. So the task I just showed you actually gives us a nice opportunity to test that idea. Okay? Um, because gate, we think that gating policies are a way for us to accommodate the temporal structure of the world. And other things. But we can know what we're supposed to do in a situation, but you don't know when contexts that are relevant to, to whatever your rules are going to come about, or when they're going to be, need to be used. And so gating helps you do that. And almost every task you do, I mean, it doesn't matter what task you're running in the lab, um, will show a function like this when people do it for the first time. Okay, this is classic power law, right? In this case, it's a simple detection task. You're just being asked to press a button when a particular target item comes up, okay? But what you'll see, we always throw these out, right, for the most part. Because these are, that's just people getting adjusted or whatever. Um, but, and, and we focus here on the asymptotic phase, right, of this, which is all, which is, um, you know, right around what you'd expect for the kind of reaction time task. Right? But this is really important. This is a very simple task, right? The, the rule here is just like press a key when you see the thing. But people are still taking four, almost 400 milliseconds to do that the very first time they do it. It doesn't matter what task you're doing, no matter how simple it is, you're always gonna get that, right? I actually think we're throwing out probably the most important part of the experiment from a cognitive control perspective, because that's the moment where you have to do the rule for the very first time. 
So what's happening? There's a lot of things happening. There are a lot of ideas about that. But one thing I will contend is happening in that early phase is that people are getting the gating policy right. They don't know where things are going to appear on the screen and what dynamics and whatever else. And so they have to adjust. So we can show you some evidence of that from that chapter. So this is work being done by a postdoc in my lab, Purva Bandari, pictured up there. Um, so what, what Apoorva realized is that in this task, the rule itself is always the same. Okay, That's the rule up there. But the stimulus order can differ. The dynamics of the world can differ. Okay, so depending on if you get this right, then it will affect your performance quite apart from your knowledge of the rule. And so it provides us this opportunity to identify um, the, uh, how people are to find to test how people identify the right theme policy. So let me make clear what uh, what I mean. So when I described this before, right, this task to you, I told you that um, in the context first case, people get the one. They're going to ignore the A and they're going to input the sum. Right? They use this input B strategy. Okay? But they actually don't have to do that in this condition. They could get the one and just sort of lazily take the A and then the sum and make their decision at the end. Okay? They don't really have to use an input B strategy. So what Apoorva asked was if your whole experience with this task was the context last condition, you were only ever using output gating to do this task, and now we give you the context first condition, are you going to immediately shift to the proactive efficient strategy or will you show perhaps um, some negative transfer in some sense? Here, not of a rule, I right, have a negative transfer of a particular gating policy right, given the task you're in. And so, um, well, when he did it, this is what he found. These are showing bins of trials. So that's why you don't see the standard curve because that's, they're collapsing over several bins. Um, it's a complex graph, so I'll unpack it. This shows the first time people ever do the context first condition, right, is when they should be input gating. Okay? This is showing if they do the context first followed by another context first, which would be all the time. Not the, the triangle there. Or sorry, the square there. Uh, and the triangle up top, right, is where they have just done a whole block of context last, doing output gating, and now they're giving context first. You see? A negative transfer effect. They're worse in this case than if they had never done anything about this task. Okay. This is a control condition down here where the, one of the reviewers thought maybe we were just like discouraging people because context last is hard. And so and they were kind of feeling bad when they ended the next task. And so um, we gave them that a high load context first condition is they had to hold multiple items in memory, followed by the context, and we didn't see it. Another a regular context first, and we were showing it. Right, maybe you're thinking, well. It's task switching. Well, it's not task switching. If you switch to the, um, if you go from context first to context last, you see this. You go back to context first. You go back to context last. You don't get it again. But once they figure it out, they they, they maintain it. Okay? The other thing you know is it's not just that things are different, because the the um, um, ambiguity ambigu the, the ambiguity I just showed you in the last bit doesn't apply in the other direction. Okay, you can't do the context first strategy when the context appears last. You can't because you don't know which item is relevant, right? So there's no way the, the environment is in some sense constrains you. So there's no way you can negatively transfer in that case. Okay? And so when we do that ordering, we see no evidence of negative transfer. I'll unpack that for you if you like, but those are showing basically. Well, what about the rule itself? Okay, so we showed you that the, that the rule stayed the same, but we changed the dynamics. In the world, we see, we see negative transfer. And in fact, it's affecting those early trials, right? That early adaptation to the task. What if the rule changes? What if we actually change the items that matter? So Apoorva tested this too. He swapped out whether it was sons and ones for other kinds of, of items. And that's shown here. So this is first showing the original data. Here's showing our, um, our second experiment. And now showing in the dashed lines, the rules themselves change, <coughs> the solid lines when the rules stay the same. And what this shows you briefly is that all this effect is carried by a difference in gating and the dynamics and not about the rule itself. Okay, so the efficiency that people do do a task, how quickly they're able to adapt a new situation, and link what they know to how they behave is based on getting the right gating policies. Okay, so now what in the brain then supports this kind of learning? <coughs> well, there's been some work on people learning rules quickly. Okay, so being able to um, if you give them new SR mappings, right, and you ask them to start following them, you know, what um, what will happen? And so this is um, from an example from. Um, Thomas Rouge and Wolfensteller, where they gave people multiple different SR um, mappings and blocks, right? And they showed that when you got a new SR mapping, you got this boost in our team that dropped it totally differently. They had very different SR mappings. They also showed, and this was a bit surprising to us, 
They show decreases in the in the in the cortex, which is what you've which has been shown since time immemorial. That if you give someone the, or this, a rule over and over again, you'll see a decline in prefrontal activity, whether you're recording in cells or you're looking at fMRI. Okay. Um, but what they saw and was surprising to us was an increase in steroidal activity over time. And this was surprising to us because, from our perspective, if, if you're learning a new gating policy early in the trial, it would be exactly where you'd expect steroidal most. You didn't expect it to come on late, right? That's sort of a, it was unusual for us. So we wanted, but then again, they're not really testing gating transfer here. It's some, it's another kind of experiment. So we need to So four of us set out to do that, um, right? And so I should say that if you're interested in first trial effects, okay, you get one of them for experiments. It's a very hard thing to do. Um, we rely a lot on averaging. Um, so what you have to do is come up with a way of giving people lots of first trials, okay? And the version I just gave you, where all you really have are two strategies, input gating or output gating, doesn't really afford that. So Apoorva made things a little more complicated, um, if, it, if you can imagine. And it's a, but it gave us an opportunity to do this, right, to manipulate the, the, the kinds of gating operations we have. So he increased our rule to make it a third order rule structure. So now you have top level cues that tell you which mid level cue tells you which bottom level cue to target. And that means we're going to present five items. For trial. So bear with me here. I'm going to walk through what this looks like from the subject's perspective. I think it's really important to see how ridiculous this is to do this. Okay? So if I got like a G, I kind of have to hang on to that, right? Because I don't know if it's relevant. Then I get an and well, maybe that, that'll be relevant. Then I get this thingy, got to hang on to that. Ah, a one. I know this is irrelevant. I get this, it tells me that I care about the, this one, so that's the target. Okay? Now bear in mind, they don't get to look at this the way we all are. Right? This is coming in time, one at a time. So they have to load memory with some of them and make decisions. And you know, the, the, whatever the gating operations are here, they're very complex. Okay. You can think of this, what we would do is we'd give people practice in this where we keep manipulating the items, but we keep the structure in the rule perspective the same. So you've always got the bottom, middle, bottom, top, middle, you know, like a little lexium there, like same thing, right? Over and over and over, you get that particular sequence. And we would just uh, rotate which item it is. Okay, and we train people heavily on that structure, for example, okay, until they get high accuracy on that. And then we start changing the ordering. So we'll change it to a new ordering, and then we give them 12 trials of that new ordering, and then we change it again to another new ordering, and we give them 12 trials, and we just do that over and over again. So we end up then are with 20 cases of, of assuming that there's a new gating policy with every, or, every ordering, we get 20 new uh, first trials, 20 second trials, 20 third trials in this order. With me? Yeah. Yeah, they know it's a break and they know a new order is coming. We're not, this is not like a learning experiment. Like we're not interested in the discovery. Like this, we're just telling them like this is, we don't tell them what the order is. We don't tell them it's bottom, middle, whatever. They experience that. They know that this is. Okay. So again, our assumption here then is that each new ordering requires some kind of new. So, we teach learning then over two time scales in this test. Okay. First, it just shows you response time. Right? If I collapse across all 20 blocks, right, just to show you that we get this nice early trial effect. That we get. So they're slower when they get a new ordering, and it goes on down to F. You know, the rule is the same. Okay. Likewise, if you look at um, response time over, uh, over the, now if I break it out over blocks, you see though an interesting phenomenon. Okay, I apologize for the gratuitous plot here, but it actually makes it point. Right? Over here, I've got my blocks going from, from one to 20, and these are the trials within a block, and that's response time. You can see the very first block, right, going like this, and then as you go on down, what you see is that people start accommodating these new orderings really fast. So by about the midpoint of the experiment, they're basically accommodating these new orderings. This complex test, we all acknowledge is hard, almost immediately. With an entirely new order. So by the end of this, they're basically <coughs> seamlessly um, doing this. Okay? And they're doing so with really high accuracy, I should add. So this is error rate plotted on this axis, right? By the end of this, they're on average in a, about a 6% error rate, despite the complexity. People just are able to really acquire this task readily, and they're able to deal with lots of new situations in this domain by the end of this. Okay? So, what, what then is sort of related or correlated with these two kinds of learning in the brain? Well, um, if we do a contrast, and we kind of contrast within each block, first half of the block or the last half, the crudest thing we could do, right? 
uh, what you see is activity is greater in the frontal parietal control kind of network right? um, in the first half of the second. And again, that's something that's been seen for a very long time in lots and lots and lots of studies. Okay? What's striking though is this does not, this, the change in this network does not um, track that rapid change that, or accommodation in RT that we see within block. It's actually much slower. That declines, declines linearly over the course of a block. It doesn't have that sort of fast curve. If we actually model people's learning in terms of the change in, in response time, and then we use their own learning as a way of modeling the FRI data, um, what we find is instead that the basal ganglia, specifically the striatum and, and medial frontal um, cortex, the single opercular network, that track that, R, that RT function. And I can show you this in ROIs as well. Um, this is showing. Uh, three different components of the frontal parietal network are right, showing you sort of that slow decline in activity to baseline. Where if you look at Claudette and Kayman, you get this very rapid decline. It's mostly active in the very, very first couple of slides. And that difference, right, that, active, that activity by, um, or by, by region, by time interaction, is reliable. That's just what happens. So on, over the short learning time frame, then, we find something very different than the prior rule studies in the sense that we find that the striatum seems to be correlated with early learning, that fast learning component, right, and then seems to lead the frontal cortex. And that actually is uh, um, akin to what's seen in monkeys as well. Earl Miller has some data like this showing that the, the striatum leads the cortex, right, in rule learning companies. So we think actually those are, that dynamic is important. What if we All right, what's happening then over that long time scale? Um, so if we contrast the first half of the experiment, the second half of the experiment, and now we're taking the first 10 blocks, which is the last 10 blocks, we again see this difference uh, in, in the frontal parietal system. This is much less activity, right, except for maybe even a parietal focus in the second. Okay, and all the way back to when I was in graduate school, the way this was taught right, is that this is a transition to automaticity, and what it reflects is that the frontal lobe is sort of stopped being involved Sort of that's the classical model. Like when you get the automatic the frontal lobe, just kind of pulls back and is like, you know, done, take it away, right? And that's why it becomes automatic, and that's how they interpret these declines in activity. We're actually not sure that that's that's the case, right? And this is where we're moving now, and this is, I think, um, uh, uh, it's it changes at least in my view the way we think about um, both the frontal involvement frontal involvement in these kinds of tasks and what the basis of automaticity might. Be. That's going to be the last part of my talk. So we'll talk a little bit about, the, about um, and we think it relates to uh, a concept called dimensionality in neural representation. And what I mean by dimensionality is literally if I took a population, I took its activity across all its inputs, how many axes would I need to describe that, that the variance in that activity? Literally what I'm talking about. So a low dimensional representation would have a very small set of axes that could explain, it would explain everything based on a combination of those inputs. A high dimensional representation would have very separate activity patterns as for different combinations of inputs. And why we think that's important is a high versus a low dimensional representation um, supports a trade off between separability and generalizability. And we think both are important for control, but it's a, the, the, the trade off is really interesting. I want to illustrate that with this little really quick. Okay? So imagine I have a town like this. And I think of, of any task I want to do in this town as a route being driven from one location to another. Okay, so I can very efficiently build a road system here with a low dimensional system, right? Where I have like a road like this and there's three roads. Okay, now I can build any route I want in this, in this town by assembling it from the right sequence of these low dimensional locations. That is, right, and vice versa. But there's a problem with low dimensional road systems. Who would guess what that is? Raw limits. Traffic. Right, they're low dimensional, everybody relies on them. So I want to do two tasks at once, right? I want to multitask. Well, I'm going to end up with interference and conflict, okay? And now I need gates, right, of some type to try to manage that, all right? And so you have a trade off then. Very generalizable, low cost system, highly susceptible to interference, okay? But imagine that I had the money in the asphalt, right, and no sense of style. I could draw a, a devoted road from every location in town to every other location in town, right? If I did that, right, um, I would have, like, everyone had their own express route. There'd be no traffic in this town at all. It would be entirely current, but it would also be pretty inflexible. 
be hard to generalize it. If I built a new location in town, I have to either build routes to every other one or, or some other base. I have no, no, there's no similarity structure here on which I can generalize. And so um, I, our kind of overall hypothesis, and I admit we're early days here, so speculative, is that early on, Control being able to follow rules requires relies on these low dimensional representations. You have to assemble them. So all of those gating policy bits I'm talking about is assembling things out of low dimensional representations. But as you learn a task very well, the cortex starts to create pattern separated representations of these tasks that are separable. So it favors separability, and that actually makes you more efficient. You can you can start to sh time share. You can um, do things at the same time as that task. That's the definition of automaticity. Right, and it's low interference, but they're not very flexible. They're pretty rigid at that point. Okay. And so um, in these data, then that would predict that not just would you see an increase in activity, but we'd see greater pattern dissimilarity in, in the frontal cortex at the end of that learning or after learning is happened. Okay. So the way a Porva tried to test this in this data set was he um, he took he divided the data in half, so the first half and the second half, and then he would take a given item. Let's say uh, the one in these two orderings, right, from say these two blocks, a couple blocks. And you ask, what's the pattern associated with those two, those ones? If it's a low dimensional coding of one, it should be very similar. Okay, but if one is going to change depending on its position in the order, right, as a high dimensional code, it will become more pattern dissimilar. So he asks them, how does this change, the similarity of one change, you go from the first? Yeah, people automate this. Okay. So here's what he found. Is that um, on the on the y-axis the pattern distance? The bigger we get, the higher the pattern dissimilarity. On the x-axis are the three different cues: top level, mid level, and lower level. Lower level. So he found some evidence that in the second half of the experiment, you do get greater um, pattern dissimilarity, right, for all the cues, particularly for the top level. Perhaps there's some evidence that um, these become more pattern separated, right, as they as they go on. Okay. So I'm going to say more about this now, but I want to give you kind of just take a breath and tell you sort of where we are where we are. So first, work memory is an important part of control, right? So the right gating policy will improve task performance. Okay. This has a lot of consequences by the way if you're interested in like special groups like patients or kids or, or older adults, right? That sometimes if they look like they're doing bad on a task, right, and you think, oh, I don't have good executive function, maybe, but it could be that they just picked the wrong gating policy. In fact, we have some evidence of that. Um, and people are able to transfer these policies to new situations. As a, as a way of rapidly learning. We think that um, that rapid learning is supported by the, by the stratum, the corticostriatal interactions, and that there's a slower cortical learning that results in a transition to automaticity. And perhaps that's, rela that's related to some type of pattern integration process. But I put two asterisks here because the evidence I've shown you is pretty weak. But, right, there's the, the evidence I've shown you is I get greater dissimilarity in, in these are in these NDPA estimates, these multi-voxel estimates, late in an fMRI experiment. And it's very hard to distinguish those. And we do it a little bit, but it's really hard to convince ourselves that those aren't noise driven. Okay? And so um, we need a way in, um, to test the format then of these neural population codes in human prefrontal cortex if we really want to test the hypothesis. So um, in the last like 10 minutes or so, I want to tell you about a new effort in the lab that we're doing to do this. This is actually, I think, what I'm now most excited about. Um, in order to, but it's very methodsy. So it's going to be how we basically are going to try to define, or how we're trying to define dimensionality of neural representations using fMRI. Um, so let me give you some rationale for that. So most methods that exist in neuroscience right now, whether in animals or in humans, for estimating dimensionality use uh, effectively multivariate classification methods. Because you can, the more individual independent class, classifications I can make, of binary classifications I can make in a population, the higher its dimensionality. So you sort of use that as a way of estimating it. And that's been done in the non-human primate, Hiragati did it, as well as, um, uh, as, in, as in trying to use it to do fMRI in humans using multi-voxel patterns. The problem, though, of using that, if you're interested in the prefrontal cortex like I am, is that MVPA seems appears fundamentally limited to prefrontal cortex. Um, and uh, Apoorva, the same postdoc who was working with two prior products, uh, conducted a meta-analysis of 800 decoding studies, uh, uh, or 800 decoding analyses over 76 different fMRI studies, okay? looking at the, the focus on the frontal lobe. Okay? 
when we did our own complementary analysis of SRI data. And what I'm plotted here is this is decoding accuracy, and this is the probability densities for um, reported significant effects and reported null effects. Okay. So first off, the significant effect for frontal across these studies of the frontal lobe is at about 57% or so, over a 50% chance classification. I almost called it 57% <laughs> plus or minus 3. <laughs> um, but okay, the reported null distribution. Okay, if I were to take this, this is the 95th percentile of that distribution, 23% of the reported significant difference falls below that, that, that uh, 95th percentile of that distribution. Now, I'm not, we don't know effect sizes, so I'm not saying that the, that many studies are false positive, not at all. What I am saying, though, is the signal is incredibly low in PFC for doing decoding. Uh, and that's not the case for other parts of the brain. So this is showing in that same paper, right, here's the frontal decoding. And here is a meta-analysis of occipital. Um, and ventral temporal, we can see that their um, accuracy is expected accuracy is much higher, okay, 60s, high 60 to 70 percent. And indeed, they have a plausible number that are even, even higher, up at 90 percent. There's a countable number, like three or four. We actually address each paper individually in our paper that ever got higher than 90 percent on the frontal level. We think there are reasons for each one of them that they did that. Um, so, your expected accuracy is very low. And by the way, it's not just because of what you're decoding. In animals, you can decode rules with 90% accuracy in the in, in neurons in the frontal lobe. But if you look at FRI <laughs> of the, that decoding, you get the same. Just looking at rule studies, you get the same. With respect to so it's much worse in PFC than it is in other parts of the brain. Why that is, is it remains an open question. We rule out a bunch of kind of obvious things in that paper. But our going hypothesis for why it's harder has to do with the nature of the sort of mesoscale organization of neurons in the prefrontal cortex relative to these other areas. So if you're in areas of, say, visual cortex, um, there's a well-known kind of clustering by feature, right? There's a columnar organization, for example. Right? What that means is that if I'm looking at a voxel, that's these boxes here, right? I'm taking the aggregate activity out of that, the voxel the voxel difference is going to be greater. It's going to be large here because of those slight biases. But in the frontal cortex, at least based on the physiology that's been done, there's a much greater mixing of coding, of feature coding, and among neurons within, within PFC, such that the voxel to voxel differences are kind of more random, right? The voxel to voxel differences are going to be small in the aggregate. Okay? And so it's a voxel resolution issue. In theory, if we could scan down to the level of neuron, we'd be coding just as well as the monkey study that, right? But because we're way scaled up at the, at, at the fMRI level, we have very low multivariate SNR. So we need a method then, if we're interested in dimensionality, we're interested. We need a method that allows us to estimate dimensionality that's not dependent on um, voxel resolution, okay, that can be a single voxel measure. And so we actually have gone, turned back to repetition suppression as a method for doing this. Uh, and this is work that's been supported the last couple of years by an R21 from NINDS and with, in collaboration with Mattia Rigotti, um, uh, uh, Mattia Rigotti and Stefano Fusi of Columbia, who are uh, computational neuroscientists. Um, and so just to, you know, if you don't, aren't familiar with the concept, repetition suppression is this thing where if I drive a cell okay, with a particular input, and I get the same input, I'm going to get a suppressed response from that cell. And there's been some nice work um, from Tim Barron's group and others showing, some reviews showing that you can use repetition suppression as a proxy for pattern distance in neural populations. Okay, so if I have a, this is the population that's active for Stimulus X, and I present X again, I get a big suppression, right? If this is uh, the, um, the population for Y, um, and I'll save you the trouble, the purple things here do in no way overlap with the green things here, so they're completely, they're completely apart, there's no suppression at all. But if you have a partial separation, if you do between Z and X, you'll actually get a partial suppression because it's not at the level of the input stimulus, learning happens, it's the level of the neuron. So you can use then these suppression measures as a proxy for distance in pattern space, same as you might a, a, a multi-voxel pattern, right? So we, um, our, so our first experiment doing this, we wanted to really encourage people to form high-dimensional representations. So we created a task that not only we're going to give them lots and lots of practice doing it, the actual decision relies is is it would have an advantage if you have a multi, if you have a high-dimensional conjunction. The categorization task, so we give people, sorry about the blurry images, but they get faces and scenes, 
that it appear along with a, a tone that appears higher. Right? So the face is female or female, uh, expressing the the, um, the scene is indoor or outdoor, and the tone is is higher. Right? And they take the conjunction of those and they make a category decision A or B. These are the categories: right? like indoor male low, or outdoor male high, or indoor female high, or outdoor female low as category. Um, I'll plot this for you. It's a, it's imagine I have a cube where each dimension is one of these. Okay. We designed it such that the vertices of this cube are in such a way that you couldn't put a plane through this to, to divide the categories. It's a nonlinear category decision. And so if you've got a nonlinear representation of this, or if you have a high dimensional representation, of this, okay? that's the only reason we did it. Now, what's our approach for estimating dimensionality? Um, if we're on time, I'm going to just, I'll get to the punchline. If you think of repetition and compression as being a distance in pattern space, I can when we, when we estimate dimensionality using using MBTA, that's what's depicted up here. I take all the voxels, I take a vector of activity in voxels, and I compute their distance to two different conditions. I do that for all the different condition pairs. I create an RSA matrix, repetitional a representational similarity matrix, and then I take the rank of that matrix effectively, estimating its dimensionality. In this case, we take every possible ordering of our eight, of our eight conjunctions. So every vert vertex of that cube, we take every possible ordering. So A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, we create a 64 by 64 matrix of the repetition effects. And we estimate all those repetition effects. And now we take the rank of that matrix, and that gives us our dimension. Now that's 64 repetition effects we have to estimate, plus eight singletons to reference it to. Okay, so we need a lot of data, so in brief, we collect, we do five sessions per subject. We use a special type one index one sequence so you can rapidly sample where they run. And we get approximately 4,600 to 5,000 trials per person. So we can get close to 50 observations per cell of our repetition matrix, right? In order to be able to um, do the singular value decomposition. Okay? So it's a, it's a whole methods project. A lot of data. Um, I'll quickly say that the if this is showing pattern reliability estimated using MBPA versus estimated using repetition suppression, where it's blue, MBPA is more reliable, shows higher split half reliability than repetition suppression, where it's red, repetition suppression shows higher um, split half reliability than MBPA. And the key piece for me is that from a low person is that in CLPSC, we see higher um, reliability for the repetition suppression method than we do for the Um, I mean, roughly this, but it's, but um, yeah, the repetition suppression also is pretty high there, and it would make sense. It's a sparse representation. Yeah, I should say that one big caveat is we're still, this is all in development for us. There's a lot of assumptions we have to make here, so this is our first task, but this is so far what we're seeing, okay? Um, is that pattern approach is actually better for most of the brain. If you've been doing it in visual cortex, keep doing that. But for if you're interested in the frontal lobe, you might consider repetition suppression. And then I'll, the big, big wind up for the punchline, but if you actually now look at dimensionality, right, when doing the parity task, okay, um, this is plotted here. So here I'm not showing you activity, right? This heat map is actually numbers of dimensions estimated by the procedure. We do a lot of penalties, so you're not going to be up to date maximum, right? But um, what you can see is first lateral prefrontal cortex, right, and particularly going up even to rostral prefrontal cortex, is near peak dimensionality relative to higher dimensionality than other areas of the frontal parietal control system that are um, estimated to be about half that dimensionality. And, I apologize, it's a different color scale, but uh, um, now the bluish is in lower dimension than the red. Um, it's also different than the basic angle. So straight and interesting enough, shows a low dimensional estimate, whereas again, lateral prefrontal cortex is, very, is, is near peak or near maximal dimensional estimate. So, Again, all of this comes with the caveat that we are, this is work that's ongoing. We have a lot of things to verify, so, but we think it's more exciting. More it's about the promise of the approach, and we think it's theoretically very interesting. So, um, prefrontal cortex can maintain, then um, potentially can maintain uh, task information in the high dimensional. So, in, um, the, we see some evidence of high dimensional repetition in prefrontal cortex in a task in which it's advantageous to hold them. Right. Obviously, one thing you'd want to test if you verify this is that um, does that happen for tasks where you don't need a high dimension? Right? Is it obligatory right, when, when you automate it? Um, 
and then uh, and potentially lower dimensional representations in other areas, including, uh, interestingly enough, behavior. Might be consistent. We can again show the behavioral evidence of this at some point. The hypothesis that we're speculating now. If I'm associating that with this early learning task, that could be advantageous. And so one interesting idea that we're we're now gonna um, want to pursue in the next few years is task flexibility. Then our ability to control ourselves is about balancing the way I assemble my task, that that bridge between all of that. Do I assemble it out of low dimensional generalizable codes, or do I rely on a on a, a highly compiled and separated representation of the task um, with avoid interference for those kinds of things? And we think that's sort of uh, that's the direction. So obviously this work takes a lot of people. So I want to recognize uh, four of us who did a lot of the uh, work here, a lot of the on the ground work. Really, Kegovitz is a graduate student lab working on this, and Kushi Kikimoto is a graduate student who works with uh, Ulrich Meyer and is now in the lab doing a lot of work on this. And also our collaborators at Columbia And thank you for your uh, attention. <laughs> Nothing in the So um, I just want to, um, I, I love the idea of doing that. Um, maybe you said it. Um, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the um, that far and that had high um, dimensionality, but also a case that had the best um, part of that's right. Yeah. And it's, I just want to use this got two regions of the brain that have the same reliability, but one of them has a high dimensionality and the other one doesn't. What makes it or not? You're, you're exactly right. So I think one thing we're doing, I mean, one thing this approach does allow us to do is the MEPA and the MEPAC. So we want to find this importance. So in areas where um, we can get good estimates from the MEPA, right, that we see basically the same dimensionality, that would be the focus on the early areas. But, but we're raising the more general point, I think, is important. If you're relying on a method to estimate, uh, if you're using that dimensionality, you're just you're doing RSA, or you're doing classification analysis, and you're contrasting your different regions of the brain, you're making an assumption about their, their, their liability, right? Or their it's definitely not the case. And this matters a lot in like working memory, for example. People are now saying, oh, you can't decode the um, information in working memory from PSC, so the PSC is not involved in working memory. Maybe it's not, but we also know there's that then as a method. Um, perhaps. So, so this is the interesting thing. So it's a really important point. The task structure, we're interested in the, the, rep, the dimensionality of the neural representation. And so the question is how that matches on to the dimension, what that implies for behavior. So if I have, yes, I could describe that task as a, in a low dimensional way, it's three dimensions. Scenes and tones, right? But it could be that the, the prefrontal cortex, though, it projects all those um, those conjunctions into space. So its representation is high dimensional. What does that mean? We think it means that it's a little bit more efficient. So, so um, perhaps what you're getting to is that we need to show that's the that's where, where we go now that we've started getting our feet under us about methods. That the behavioral consequence of this, right, is that where you've developed the higher dimensional code, you'll see greater. So it's difficult for you to keep a copy of the Sure. Uh, sure. So, is this the case in the class? Um, where you were doing the or are we? Um, they were trained, uh, sorry, the question was, were we training people in the magnet for the, in the first case? You're talking about the, the um, oh, in this, in the last one, yeah. the parity task. Were we training during that or did we wait till they were done? Good question. No, we train them to criterion. They actually train up to 90% outside the magnet. So when we actually scan them, they are just doing the rules. It's not, they're, we're hoping they're relatively stable. I guess the follow-up question is, how does this dimensional 
who, as I understood it, was a learning for accountants. I should have mentioned this is a product of the claim theory, um, which we're relying on basal ganglia. Consistent with that, or That's a great question. Um, so the question is, uh, how does this map onto ideas um, where we are learning a nonlinear categorization rule, for example, right, and um, the involvement of the basis? That's a good question. Um, so I guess it would, I mean, we, we're saying that over the course of learning, um, that you'll come to depend on cortex. So I, I know even like the, 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 mod the, the models of like those sort of um, information integration tasks, right? Assume that the stratum is involved, but it trains the cortex to some degree. And so that could be consistent with what, with what we see as well, right? Mm -hmm. That you start with a low dimensional and, and, you, and, and so and the stratum is important in that. But as you automate that task, as you get better, you sort of can change to the cortex. But um, yeah, it's a good question whether or not that, I mean, it is the case that at least these data, we think the stratum is not as involved as we would think. Well, but so, mm -hmm. I just want to ask whether you mean cortex or frontal for this particular. So, I'm thinking about the relationship to hippocampus, where the story was you know, the story is that it's sparse, hippocampus is more distributed. So, I guess in the, in the, in the, um, the notion of dimensionality, the, the cortex would be the, the lower dimensional structure, right? So, Actually, no, so no. So the question is, as I understand it, is is the, the hippocampus be considered low dimensional? No, sorry. No, 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 sorry. I, I think I think the dimension, the word dimensionality there is is kind of tricky. There's oh, I see. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I understand what you're yeah. saying. Yes. So, so what you're asking is about like the difference between cortex and hippocampus in the learning yeah, framework, and, what, and whether when you when you answer Emily's question, whether you really meant the cortex quality relative to what you say, whether you're talking about the prefrontal cortex. I was talking about prefrontal cortex yeah. in particular, and it's surely the case that there are parts of cortex that can have abstraction, right? and there have to, there, there can be. And I do think actually this is why, I mean, at, at a high level, I do think studying dimensionality is interesting because you could imagine that you know um, across the cortex, right, whether representations tend to be high or dimensionally impact impacts what's read out of them. I'm interested in networks. I'm interested in different areas of cortex. Whether they hold things in low dimension, a lot. If you're interested in connectivity, you found a hub, a hub region, right? Lots of things coming into it. Well, the, the significance of that hub is very different. If you think that that hub is a low dimensional representation, effectively collapsing, essentially forming the PCA over its inputs, it's forming, it's collapsing over those to some general components, right? Or you think it's high dimensional, and what it's doing is actually producing a bunch of mixtures of, rep of those representations pulled out, read out downstream. It has very different implications for what it means to have a hub. So it's it's just it's another aspect of, of of understanding the brain that I think is really consequential from what we know. I'm talking about prefrontal cortex. Yeah, and so but just to clarify the terminology, to make sure I'm understanding. I think that you are using uh, high dimensional to mean something very close to sparse, and then low dimensional be more like population closely inherited. Um, so do I mean that when I do I mean high dimensional to mean something sparse um, versus population closely? Not necessarily. So a sparse code is one way to achieve a high dimension. You would have essentially a separate, you know, un, a non-overlapping set of neurons. The work from uh, uh, Stefano Fusi and Mr. Rigotti in prefrontal cortex has highlighted um, what are called nonlinear mixed selected cells. Right? So the contribution of those cells to a population code actually can enhance and, um, or uh, make it high dimension. And that's actually what we think is probably the physiological basis. It's really just a statement. I mean, the dimension of it is just a statement about the variance. If I plot the, all the states of that population, right, what the, what's the variance in those states over the different inputs? It can be achieved in all kinds of ways. Thank you for your attention. This isn't my my computer. <laughs> yeah.